Hi, in this tutorial we'll take a look at the new image array nodes with a touch of mega scans and finally the height plane node. Let's dive right in and we have the image arrays under the right mouse click in the node graph and there's a new subfolder called image arrays. In here we have the array mix, axis projection array and image array which are modifications of default Mari extension pack nodes such as the mix node, axis projection and image nodes. Now these nodes all support up to six simultaneous images. So if we take a look at the node properties of this image array, for example, we have the regular image node properties that you're used to from the standard UV image node, such as the stencil mode. And then we have a total of six image slots. Why six? Because Megascans usually comes with six or seven different images per material for offline rendering. Seven if you count in both bump and normal map, but you know, usually six I found quite all right. So this is why they come with six slots. I could load in a, a material and, you know, set this up and I, you can put a label in here and name your different slots. But because it's a single node, it's quite easy to just go after you set it up, file, export notes. So I've already prepared some notes. So I'm going to load in my pre-prepared little material notes. Where is it? Here is it. So here's my soil node and I'm going to import the stone node as well. And if you're searching for something, you can always press J and for example, you know, you could press type stone and I would find it. Let's move this over here. Let's give this a tiny little second to load all the images into Mari. So you can see I've got all my different mega scan images in here. And now we could go ahead and just hook this up to our shader. So for example, I would hook this one up, this one, this one. And for example, I could do a combination out of my displacement and bump map. Now you'll notice that I've loaded in the images exactly in the same order that they appear in the shaders. It's just easier. I find it this way. Um, we'll take a look in a second or at the end of the tutorial, how we can actually change these output names. So they're more, more representative of what you would want depending on your workflow. So let's plug this into the displacement slot and view the shader. And here we have something at least, you know, it's all right-ish. And there's a few things obviously you could do. Let me, for example, play around with the displacement. It looks quite spiky. This, I think this bump map is just a high pass or something. So it was a very, very poor bump map for this. So I'm going to stick with the displacement on this. But let me put a normal map intensity node in here, which is another extension pack node. I'm just going to slot that in so I can adjust the intensity of the normal map. And now we can kind of go ahead and kind of tweak our intensity a little bit. But let's take a quick look at the shader first that I'm using. I'm using a standard Mari BRDF shader. You can see I have my glossiness here because I'm feeding in a, a roughness map. I'm inverting it. But let's quickly take a look at this displacement section. Now I'm using a standard Mari, or well, a standard plane, I would say. It's it's subdivided once, but um, the main work comes from the tessellation, so the screen tessellation. Now, one important setting is the perturb normals. It's on by default in every shader, but it's an absolutely horrible setting. So make sure to turn it off. I'm going to show you now how it looks with perturb normal on. So with perturb normal on, basically a new normal will be generated for each point or for each face. And then it looks like this, which is really, really bad. So do yourself a favor and turn it off and let the normal map actually do the work. So then we have, you know, just basically we're using it for shading. So if I change my lighting a little bit, you can see I'm getting nice shadowing, etc. So you can use it for the height information, but the normal map should do the fine detail work. Let me actually put a set range in here so I can control my displacement height for this. It looks a little bit odd here and there. Now, if you're feeding in a 32-bit displacement, turn off the clamp intermediary in the set range node. Uh, otherwise, you know, the old max will be, and old min will be clamped to 0 to 1 if this is on. So let's leave it. But because in this case, I think it's a 16-bit um, 0 to 1 displacement, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to not... No, I should have beat good. No, there's no difference at all. So but you can use the set range node to basically control the height of the displacement. Uh, we should always try and keep a midpoint of 0 0.5 because our shader obviously is set to 0 0.5 bias. But in this case, you know, let's just ignore it for a second. Now, next up, I'm going to, I want to combine the stone material with this. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a mix material. So basically I have a new node array mix, which is a massive node. 
but its whole job is basically combining two different array nodes. So let's hook this up quickly. Now a little bit of a fast forward here, but all I've done is literally just hook up these two materials to the um, array mix node. So all these slots for the, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F for the background and for the foreground. Currently the foreground overlays the background completely. So the stone material is on top of the uh, soil material just because I don't have a mix mask defined yet. Uh, obviously one thing I noticed, you know, the scale wasn't quite right on the soil. So I just put a simple manifold UV in here and just changed the scale a little bit. So it's very easy to modify all these nodes simultaneously just with the manifold. I also chucked the bump map. You know, I'm just going to use the displacement map for now. Like I said, there's no mix mask defined yet. That defines how these two materials are mixing, but there's also a decal mask slot. Now the decal mask would be a mask that gets applied to the respective slots. So for example, the decal mask here would be applied only to the foreground slots. So if you need, for example, to place a label or something and you need to apply this only to the foreground or only to the background, then this is the slot to use because it'll, it's going to be evaluated before the mix mask. So uh, you can use that. In terms of node options, we have simple mix sliders on the array mix node as well. So we could, you know, blend over the color from the soil, etc. But usually you would want to use a mix mask for that. So I'm going to create a new node, which is the height plane node. Now, for anyone familiar with Megascan Studio or Substance Designer, this won't be a total shock. Basically, this node allows you to blend together two materials quite realistically based on their displacement maps. So I'm going to take my background displacement map and my foreground displacement map and I have two output slots. I can either have the combined height, the combined displacement or the mask how they're blending. So I'm interested in the mask and plug this into the mix mask. Now you can see straight away we're getting some very very nice blending right off the bat. So let's take a quick look at the no properties of the height blend. So we have the height offset which basically determines how one material gets pushed through the other. We have a contrast slider so you can define you know how sharp the contrast is. And then we have the mode. The balanced height basically will recalculate the combined displacement all the time, while the background priority will always just push the background through the foreground. You know, basically it's a very simple thresholding kind of thing. So it doesn't recalculate anything. So the background priority will, I don't know if it's a good example to show it. Like this will literally push through, while this one will keep recalculating the two together. So you will always end up with a little bit of different um, heights in here. So for example, these would, these hills here, these soil hills would pick up a little bit of displacement from underneath these stones as well. While with the background priority, it's either or. Now we have a simple opacity that controls the opacity of the foreground. And then we have the mask weight. Now you can apply a mask for the foreground. So for example, if I create a FBM noise and hook this up to the mask, and let's jump to the node properties of the FBM. And now you can see we can kind of have like a little bit of a masking effect. Obviously, you could even paint this mask. You know, it doesn't, no one's stopping you to create a painted mask for this. But if we go back to our height blend node here at the bottom, we have the mask weight. And basically, if I push it over one, it's going to start gaining the mask. So you can see it's starting to push in. Well, if I go below, it'll obviously start multiplying against the mask. So I can use that to kind of control the mask a little bit further. Now obviously both the offset and the contrast are exposed, so you could even map this. Uh, we could even try this just right now. What happens? I'm not sure what will happen, to be honest. Well, not really what I anticipated, but it does something. You know, you can kind of push it right through each other. It's a bit weird, but it's actually not too bad. So you get some nice fading while you still have the high density here. So. It's not too bad. Um, yeah, but basically this allows you to map the offset as well as the contrast. And again, the mask can be used and you can paint stuff, etc. For example, if you need to, I don't know, place rocks around corners and stuff like that. So you could paint a mask with this. Next up, we'll just take a quick look at how we can actually deal with the output. So for example, you can see here we have the output A, B, C, D, E, F. It's not really pretty or intuitive. Because, yeah, I mean, there's currently no way to set them automatically in a way that, that every customer or like every user would be happy with it. So I decided to just name it very generically. However, we can easily change that. So I'm going to show you a little bit how to change that. It's going to get a bit cody, but uh, it's very easy. So just stick with me. So you'll want to open a text editor and browse to your Mari extension pack folder. So Mari scripts. In here we have the extension pack and go to the shaders subfolder and the node library. 
In here we have an array folder and in here are the three array nodes. So let's open the image array. Let's say, for example, you want to change the output names, right? So you want to always have the nice outputs depending on what kind of data you usually put into output A. So we have something called the pretty name. So you simply rename this pretty name to, I don't know, base color. And you save this. And the next time you open Mari, all your nodes will have this as a pretty name. The same is true for any attribute inside of the node. So for example, here we have all the attributes that are inside of the image node. So we have these six different image slots. So we have the tile image and the tile image also has a pretty name. So you can change this as well. So let's say base color. You could also put a default label if you want, you know, so if you want to change the actual label, so the text label where you can enter your description, you just enter it between the end of this bracket and the, the end of the attribute. So in here. Now the same thing is true for the inputs. So if we go, for example, to the array mix, Right up here, we have all the inputs. So you can see we have our decal mask, etc. And in here, we have again the pretty name. So we could say, okay, base color. And we save this. And let's jump to Mari. So now inside of Mari, if I create the image array node, you can see my output is named base color, just as the way I defined it here in the pretty name. And if I double click, you can see my first slot here is also called base color. And the label also already has a base color in here. Again, as defined in the label section here and the pretty name for the input. Now, if I go to my array mix, you can also see the base color slot has been added to the inputs. So this way you can modify these nodes and make them kind of your own a little bit and define them in a way that fits your workflow best. Now, this concludes this tutorial for the array nodes. And I hope they're useful.